I, don't, I wouldn't say that they're lacking in military capabilities. I would say it has to do with the people first. Taiwan needs to have a very, very strong, and this is probably controversial, I would say a Taiwanese identity and say, hey, we are not going to be defeated on our land. Mm. We, we're all going to partake. And when you have that type of backing, anything is possible. I believe Taiwan can do it. Do you mind just briefly introducing yourself? My name is Brandon Sanchez. I'm 40 years old. From 2015 to 2022, I was currently serving as active duty for the United States Army. Around two years ago, there was a big piece of news that came out that uh, American special forces were in Taiwan. Were you any way involved in that operation? I was part of that force package. We were here to assess and generally see the, the full capabilities of the Taiwanese Army, increase their knowledge and to take their training to a next level to help Taiwan become a, a better nation and a better army. Did you observe any differences in operation procedure or just a way of thinking between the Taiwanese military and your counterparts? Yes. The one thing that the United States just does great and it empowers soldiers to make decisions. And Taiwan I would say it's still developing in that sense of empowering its own soldiers to, to take accountability, to take charge. The United States is, we're, we're very flexible. We have the, the ability and, and the capacity to, to change on the fly. And what a lot of nations lack is they're very, very strict to their doctrine. If you tell them to take three steps, turn, and look, they're gonna take three steps, turn, and look. We can get pictures from satellite from three months ago. But when we get down there, it's like, hey, the mission told us to go through this field, but we were expecting it to be a little bit more concealment. Now things have changed on the battlefield. One of the strengths of the United States is we're changing. For some of our other counterparts, we're like, nope, that's, that's the mission. This is where we're going. And we're like, no, 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 we're not doing <laughs> no. that. I think that's interesting because there's this impression that American soldiers will just follow orders to the T no matter what. The United States Army, we question authority all the time. We just do it more in private. Depending on your rank, of course, you, you just don't go from a private and you just go to a team leader. Yeah. You say, hey, I don't like how this is doing. As the mission moves down the echelons, you make it personal and it becomes, hey, our objective is to take this hill, but how we take the hill is up to us. What you observed in Taiwan, though, is whatever the commander said, no matter what, would be followed to the T. Under my observation, yes. It was mostly just, hey, we're stationary. Our party's coming. Mm. They mobilize, they move, they do what they need to do, and it stops. One of their capabilities that they were lacking was their ability to operate and fight at night. They're very scripted in everything that they do because they want to put on a good face. Did any of the training here have real life scenarios built into them? I didn't really see much injects. It's like we're, we'll, we'll take someone and say, hey, you're dead now. Or we'll take a key leader out. Hey, you're dead now. How do we adapt? How do we adapt and overcome? And I just remember you mentioning how you trained uh, Indonesian personnel. Do you mind describing the training? That's called JRTC. It's mm. in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Nobody likes going to Fort Polk. Nobody, <laughs> nobody <laughs> likes, it, it is not, <laughs> yes. It's about a good 15 days of consistent fighting throughout those 20, 28 days. And we're right there with them. And I think that probably gave them confidence to work with other nations, especially on, when they're out of their comfort zone. Utilize everything that they, they have from their English to any type of communication. And in that 15 days of good fighting, daytime, nighttime, they went from being a not so capable force at nighttime to storming a, a village at nighttime and taking the objective and winning. So do you feel like that kind of training could be implemented here to produce better results in a potential conflict situation? I'm hoping that they're really implementing those types of training events where they're straining to win. It should be fought with you know, blood, sweat, and tears, with a unit, with, with everything that, you, that, that they have. It tests the soldier's capability, our fatigue, our, our food supply. There's, there's one time uh, when I was with the, the 82nd that we ran out of water. When you got over 200 people moving around and you can't supply them with water, it's like, hey, no more shaving for the next you know, three days. Those circumstances, those, those stress points, those friction points, mm. you have to learn. And if you never are failing in something, you're never really gonna truly succeed. And if everything is scripted and planned and everything works great, when real battle comes. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do yeah, when, when stuff is, doesn't go right? Just based on the training that you observed, do you feel that Taiwan is ready for a potential conflict with China? 
I said they're getting there. And I, don't, I wouldn't say that they're lacking in military capabilities. I would say it has to do with the people first. Taiwan needs to have a very, very strong, and this is probably controversial, I would say a Taiwanese identity and say, hey, we are not going to be defeated on our land. Mm. We, we're all going to partake. And when you have that type of backing, anything is possible. I believe Taiwan can do it. They've done it before. Yeah. They, they've kept the island independent up until now. Yes. I, I would love for Taiwan just to come out and, and declare it's who it is. Me personally, I don't like the status quo. Yeah. Is, is it safe? Yes. But it's not convenient. It's not, it's not good for the people. We need, you need to be united under something, whether that's ROC, Taiwan, pick something. The, the nation will do great things when there's a national pride. If there was a conflict to break out, do you think that most people at this point would be willing to fight and potentially die to protect Taiwan? Some. It's, it's different. We also have a very strong gun culture, and that gun culture kind of empowers individuals is to, to take part in, into something. It kind of gives you like the, if they're gonna come, bring them, you know? Yeah, we got, we're prepared. <laughs> we're prepared. To give Taiwan a, probably its own Second Amendment in some shape or form would be empowering citizens to stand up and fight more because they have the capability. That's a good deterrence for China to even come into an invade. It's like, why would no one invade the United States? Because we got more guns than people. Uh, and some are just gun enthusiasts. And that's all they do. They just love shooting guns. And so when you have a populace that is armed, no one wants to come over. You're, just, you're fighting too many people. Do you feel like here, if you gave everyone guns, there would be the same potential social issues that would arise? I think yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would. Because people at the end of the day are just evil. But if you think about how many guns we have in the United States, or how many gun violence, mm. we're actually very low. Arizona, for example, it, that's the wild, wild west. Mm. You can have a, a gun concealed and unconcealed without a permit. The robberies and all that stuff is starting to go down because now they got to have two guns because now they got to watch their back mm. because everyone's carrying now. People are going to be violent no matter where. How many American lives do you think America would be willing to lose to defend Taiwan? We would be what we're probably doing for Ukraine, helping in the rear of supplies, information. If we're in the front, that's our war now. Yeah, it's turning into World War III potentially. Yeah. How many lives do you think Taiwan would be willing to give up to keep its freedom? That's a good and, and, and hard question to ask because one life is too many. And, and it's a hard thing to say, but someone has to die. You would have to go this on an individual basis. Like, am I willing to lay my life down mm -hmm. for this cause? If you're 30 and above, you, you would definitely will. Think anything underneath 30, I don't think they have the mindset yet. I have my own identity here that if something happened that I would pull up arms and, and come. And, and hopefully people would follow. If there was a conflict, you would personally get involved yes. in the conflict? Yes, I would. As a civilian. And, and if that means taking up arms, that means doing my part, yes, I would be over here as soon as I can. Mm. Even if it's just from afar or, or helping people on the street, like I will be here. I have an investment here. Yeah, you have a family here now. Yeah. Yeah. What are the things that you like about Taiwan that need to be defended and, and cherished? Taiwan, to me, is it's beautiful. It's starting to be like the United States of Asia. The freedoms that they have here, they're the freedom of expression. They're the very first uh, Southeast Asian nation to legalize gay marriage. And they're leading on cutting edge policies of, of just true freedom. And if they continue on this, this path, it, it's just going to continue to get better and better. And that's why I love coming here. <laughs> I really just love nice. coming here.